Welcome to The Hidden Truth, Breaking the Silence. I'm your host, Jonathan McLernan. Each episode, we explore stories of individuals and how they've been affected by being a part of a secretive Christian fellowship. The stories shared here may include speaking about sensitive topics suited for a mature audience. Dysfunction happens when doctrine meets dogma and silence is paramount. So let's pull back the veil on today's episode of The Hidden Truth. All right, welcome back to another episode. Uh, it is my honor and privilege today to be chatting with Sheree Krop, who is the author of an incredible book called Preserving the Truth. So we're going to explore Sheree's journey uh, personally within the fellowship and departing the fellowship a little bit, as well as what prompted her to spend time researching and studying this fellowship that she grew up in. So welcome to the show, Sheree. Hello. So I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So, uh, one of the things that you did was you spent 30 years of your life um, studying and researching and recording this fellowship that uh, currently you're, you're not a part of. And I'm curious to know, before we dive into that and, and this really amazing work that you've done, kind of what is your background with regards to the fellowship? I was born and raised in it. My grandparents on both sides accepted it in the 1930s. So my parents were teenagers when they professed. and. Uh, mm. So that makes me third generation. I was born in California and grew up in Mississippi on Jackson, Mississippi convention grounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have lived also in Texas and Oklahoma. My dad was from Texas, so I was familiar and came back here. And uh, I left the church in 1990. I married a uh, two by two man. I have two children. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm remarried now to another ex two by two man. Okay, so uh, you grew up on convention grounds. Uh, in so does that mean that at some point in time, like your parents had the convention grounds? Did they have that before you were born, or is that something that happened after you were born? We moved from California when I was ten years old because my mother's sinuses were so bad. We wanted to move somewhere. She was from Mississippi. And they heard that they wanted to start a convention there. There wasn't one at that time. And the okay. people were all going to Alabama convention. And Mississippi, Alabama has been considered one field for a long time. Now it's Mississippi, Alabama, and Louisiana. And so they moved there with the intent to look for a place for the convention. They found 20 acres with a 1925 house and uh, the a big pecan orchard. And the workers said this would do fine. So they built the convention there. When school was out in June, we moved on the property and a host of people and workers came in and worked on the grounds to make it into a convention by the end of October. Well, that was mm. the first one convention in 1958 or nine, nine. Okay. And, and you, were, you were 10 years old at the time? Yes. Okay. And so for, for you, um, I guess now you, you'd kind of grown up in this, but sort of watching this whole process unfold as like a 10 year old, were there, was there anything that you kind of observed, like, uh, or what, what did you notice about this when it was all taking place? What sticks out to you? Well, at first it was all very exciting and I would help various workers where they would have me painting coat hangers and just helping them make beds and whatnot. And, it was all enjoyable. And then one of them hurt my feelings really bad and uh, told me little girls didn't know anything. And uh, she had had this man uh, reassemble a bed for the workers in a brother worker visiting quarters three times to get it the right height that for him to pray on. And then she would get down and pray and get up and say, nope, we got to change it. And I said, I think it's OK. And she told me little girls didn't know anything. And I just took myself off to the house. And from then on, I stayed, kept my distance from the workers. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. And I observed I, I mean, uh, growing up that they were, they had the emotions that we all had. They were jealous. They got angry. They got mad. They did petty things. They sometimes weren't kind. They, I, I did not have them on a pedestal. They were just human mm -hmm. beings. That's how I saw them. My mother, you know, demanded that I respect them and so forth, but uh, and I did, but uh, I never idolized them. Hmm. So yeah, 
um, growing up in the convention grounds or, or spending a number of years, I guess, on the convention grounds until you left home gave kind of a unique insight into the workers that maybe others don't necessarily get when they think about this ministry. We might see them at gospel meetings or conventions when they're preaching and things like that. But uh, it gives kind of a more intimate insight into just the humanity of them and how they operate in, yes. in real life. Yes, it does. Mm. And so uh, you you carried on, you left home. Um, did you go to university or did you go into work or what was it you pursued after you left home? I'm married. <laughs> uh, I did move to Dallas, Texas with my cousin who uh, it's like a sister to me. We'd always wanted to live together and we wanted to go to a big city. And so we moved to Dallas where I had two aunts and an uncle and we worked here as career girls for a little while. And uh, my first husband got back from Vietnam and he had a job already in Dallas. So we married after that, lived mm -hmm. there for a while. Okay. So I have no university awesome. training. Yeah. At, so it's, at some point in time in your experience, um, maybe some questions started to form. Uh, sort of how long was that, or maybe what age were you when, when sort of questions started to form? Uh, and maybe what was the gap between that and ultimately deciding to no longer be a part of the fellowship? Quite a gap. Yeah. I started questioning things when I wasn't allowed to wear my hair down to school. Uh, <laughs> And I badly wanted to and was totally could not. And I could not uh, take part in what they call now PE or we call gym. Uh, if I did, I was going to have to wear a dress. And so uh, I found an out for that, though. I, I uh, went to work in the school cafeteria. They had to have somebody do that. And they would give us a grade for PE if we did the work in cafeteria and we got free lunches. So for six years, junior high through 12, I worked in the cafeteria and we had a lot of good times. Us girls had fun, you know, so that, that Those was were kind the of worst, worst things that uh, I had to put up with. Right. And that, that's sort of when you begin to sort of wonder, well, w what is this really about? Because uh, and so in, in your young mind, what sort of questions were starting to to form? Well, I wanted scripture to back up the things we had to do, and there wasn't any. And <laughs> I learned later in life that when you, if you ask questions of the workers and you might get a reply or you might get an answer, there are two different things. And if you ask for scripture basis and you get anything other than scripture basis, it's most likely because they do not have a scriptural answer. Mm. It's because there isn't one. And um, I finally came to a firm conclusion about that when at the very last when I was questioning, like I asked Harry Brownlee, where in the Bible does it say there is only one way church that you must be in to get to heaven? And he started telling me his experiences. And how the mm -hmm. workers came to his home. I'm like, where's the scripture, Harry? And he couldn't come up with one. And then I, I had thought that perhaps I had overlooked this. I wanted to make sure that uh, this wasn't in the scripture. And that confirmed it when he couldn't come up with anything. Mm. That's, a, that's an interesting observation, the difference between a reply and an answer. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think... Uh, I, I've noted that you have uh, quite a keen eye for attention to detail, um, w which is kind of interesting considering your experience with that sister worker telling you that you didn't quite get the, the height of the bed uh, right. And so yeah. some people would think, well, you know, you grew up on convention grounds, so you, you, you got to go and be a part of many, many conventions and so on that uh, maybe being steeped in this would somehow uh, deepen your faith in, in this way. But uh, there, there was these questions that came up and you weren't really able to get the answers you were looking for. So at what, what point or what age were you when you decided that you no longer wanted to be a part of the church? And maybe what was the straw that broke the camel's back for you? Well, for years, I was fairly happy in the church while I was in Texas. The friends were a lot different than they were in the South. The South was very repressed and oppressed. And 
like they didn't acknowledge that you even had a boyfriend. That was just unmentionable. You're supposed to go into work, I suppose, but I couldn't figure that out then. And Texas with Joe Crane and others and Gus Jensen, they were lots more relaxed. They had stereos in the meeting rooms. I mean, we couldn't even have a radio in Mississippi. And um, so I noticed, also knew how things were in California. I was observant out there. And I saw these differences in this way that was supposed to be the same everywhere. And that bothered me. And uh, I wanted to move from Mississippi to get away from their strict rules, especially. And Texas suited me all right. But um, I had a good friend and uh, she asked me, why do you stay in that way? I was griping about my hair or something. And she's, why do you Mm -hmm. stay in that way? And I said, because it's the only way. It's the genuine article that came down from Jesus sending out the disciples. And she says, prove it. And that started the ball rolling right there. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. So after that, I uh, happened. There was a mailing that went out to everybody in Oklahoma, all the friends list. Somebody had it from the West Coast. And uh, it advertised the secret sect. And uh, my in-laws lived in Oklahoma. So I came by that and ordered the secret sect. And that was the straw. That started my uh, quest to prove everything in the book or to disprove it. I wasn't going to just accept it without proving it. And so I obtained all my own copies of every document that he mentioned in there, which they were um, like newspapers and court records and ship records and all kinds of things. But uh, I went, you know, behind the scenes and obtained my own copies and, uh, and made two visits to the UK <laughs> after I read the, the book. But I read it, and within a year, I left meetings because everything he'd written was true. I, I proved it, and then I found a lot more to go with that. Mm. So you would have, it would have been 1989, you read The Secret Sect, and then 1990, you said, that's it, I'm, I'm done. What sort, of, what sort of feelings did you have as when you, when you, that's it. This is the decision. I'm no longer going to go to meeting. Um, I, I don't know if you recall, like, what was your last experience or your last fellowship meeting like? And and mm-hmm. did you at that point know your decision had been made? Well, I had a talk with Harry Brownlee just a few days before uh, there was a gospel meeting on a Sunday afternoon that I went to. And, you know, they're supposed to be guided by the Holy Spirit to speak. Well. He spoke directly at me and uh, just put down most everything I had said to him at our home. And I'm like, that's it. I'm out of here. (laughs) Uh, It was, you know, I was a captive audience. Nobody else knew what he was doing to me except my husband. And uh, I said, that's low down, dirty. I'm not putting up with it. So Mm -hmm. I left. Maybe that fits. I don't know if it would fit the description of like a bully pulpit, but essentially using a position of authority in a captive audience to try to uh, essentially argue with you without you being able to ask questions and kind of answer back. Yeah, I agree. Mm. Yeah. So then you go, that's it. That's it. I'm done. Um, and and what did you what did you feel and and thinking? If you're leaving this fellowship, which you had been a part of all of your life up until that point, like where where do you go from there? Well, I was well prepared when I left. For two years or more, I had been attending a Bible study called Bible Study Fellowship. And I was mixing with other ladies that were worldly ladies. And I was doing it because my friend wanted us to go to a Bible study together. And I thought maybe I could help her if I was there studying the same thing with her. I could shed some real light on it, you know. Mm. Well, the thing is, you apply and then some people get accepted and the others go on the waiting list. And she got put on the waiting list and I got accepted. And we were going with another friend. So I went ahead and I thought I can get out of this anytime I can, you know, I'm not locked into it. But I kept going. and. So I had studied Galatians. That was our subject. And Galatians 
if anything will free you to leave and realize that it's by grace through faith that we are saved. It's a study of Galatians. And um, so I had done that, but then I was asking questions while I was doing that. And I couldn't get answers. And I, I got answers, but I didn't like them. It was like, if you had the right spirit, you wouldn't question that. And uh, other things that were just attacks on me instead of, uh, you know, don't you think that's such a small thing to do just to wear your hair up for Jesus? I mean, really, shaming tactics and guilt. <laughs> and I thought, if only I knew how to argue or to come back to understand this. And so I thought, I'll get a book at the library. I go to the library and I find out that the study of arguments is considered, it's part of logic, which is a part of philosophy. That's where the books are in the library under philosophy. And so I pull one out from the shelf and it was full of all these circles and diagrams and whatnot. And I'm like, oh my goodness, you know, I need help. So <laughs> yeah. I went and enrolled in a university course in logic. It was the best thing I ever did for myself as far as education. And um, I was the only one there with all these young kids. I was 40 and uh, that wanted to use this in my life. They were taking it as a credit, to get, you know, and uh, it's right. critical thinking is what it is. And I learned so much there that, and I taught my children as, as I was doing it. And I insisted that they both take logic in college. And they said it's one of the best thing they did. So right. uh, it's just amazing. The first thing we studied was fallacies. Fallacies are a mm. faulty argument. And there's all kinds of them that I realized that's the answers I'm getting. They're not answers. That's the replies I'm getting. It was loaded language and ad hominem attacks and just diversions and red herrings and analogies and appeals for things instead of scripture, what I wanted. And uh, you learn to recognize these in everyday life. They happen, jump on the bandwagon and so forth, all that kind of thing. So uh, <clears throat> with that, that enabled me to sort through all the things that I had to go through. And I was absolutely confident when I left meetings that I was, was not leaving God's only way. I, uh, my relationship is with God. He's my supreme authority and the Bible's my standard for truth and for living. And uh, I've continued that relationship. I taught my children that when they professed and were baptized in a church we were attending, that that goes with them, that relationship. It doesn't stay with this church. It belongs to them personally. And uh, they understand that. And it's kept them from some of the things that I had to go through to get to that point and believe that. Right. Yeah. Uh, were your children, did they like profess and were they baptized in the fellowship originally? No. They were okay. um, 11 and 13 when we left, and uh, we went to a Christian church, Cherokee Hills Christian Church, and uh, that's where they both came to the Lord and were baptized in the same service even. Okay. So how do you explain to your kids, again, a fellowship they've been a part of for at that point up to um, their whole life, that we're no longer going to be a part of this and the things that you've been taught are not correct according to Scripture the way that I understand it? It was quite easy. For one thing, I never uh, pushed the rules on them, and I had never taught them it was the only way. And uh, they did pick it up from their grandparents, I found out later, uh, that she, my grand, their grandmother was trying to insist that it was the only way. But... Uh, I let them dress like they want. My daughter wasn't restricted. You know, they went to movies. The worst thing for my daughter, she couldn't have her ears pierced and every other little girl in her class had their ears pierced. This was begging, begging, crying, trying to deal, negotiate constantly. And uh, I was feeding her the lines I'd been given. You know, it says here, you're not supposed to wear gold or pearls. That's okay. I'll wear pink and silver and painted ones. I don't care, you know. She's going around it, and I was trying to make her believe things I didn't even believe myself. And 
So when we, I found out from the secret sect, I just told them, well, we thought this was the right church for us for a while, but we found out some additional information and we've decided it's not the right church for us. And they understand you get additional information, you reassess, reevaluate, and you move on. It was, they were fine with it. Okay. And, and of course, I want, I want to. Yeah. Okay. And, and I, of course, I want to spend maybe the bulk of our time discussing your amazing work in writing the book, Preserving the Truth. But I, I suppose now I, I'm curious um, what, uh, so, so you said, fine, that there's no, no scripture that speaks, that you feel like speaks against, say, something like getting your ears pierced. And we know that, like, within the fellowship, there's certain things like, you know, you have to wear your hair up or you have to have your hair long, uh, no piercings or jewelry or things like that. What, what, what scriptures like changed your mind on that where you said, okay, it actually, it actually feels like these are okay or acceptable. Well, I studied in depth, all of the women issues and uh, found out they are not supported or they're misinterpreted. There's some Greek words that were misinterpreted and uh, things were men's interpretations or men's preferences is what I figured out they were because like especially the slack something in the old testament give me a break i mean we're under the new covenant why it that had no legs to it it was just simply because they try to stay behind the fads and the styles and to be noticeable uh, almost mm -hmm. i mean yeah. i've heard them say that if the women looked like everybody else how would anybody know um you know, we were God's right way. Well, how did they know by the men? You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense. Right, right. Okay. So then at some point, this this prompted you to start on this journey. So you'd read, read The Secret Sect. You started doing a little bit of research. Um, did you start out researching, thinking, I'm going to write a comprehensive book documenting this? Absolutely not. I... <laughs> I hate history. I mean, right. period. In, class, in school, it was my most hated subject. But I, when I was <clears throat> um, reading Doug Parker's book and proving it or disproving it, I amassed quite a bunch of material and uh, additional accounts and diaries and journals and all sorts of information. And I was just sitting on it. And I thought, you know, this could be beneficial to other people, too. So I started my website called tellingthetruth.info. And I put all these documents on it and also started a photo gallery and put a lot of uh, items on there, pictures, of course. And then people would say, yeah, that's wonderful. It's huge. And, and where should I start and so forth? And I thought, I really need to put together a narrative, put this in chronological order, because it is just a hodgepodge. It's like a library. And you mm -hmm. would go in and, okay, you want to know about Cooney? And you look over here or whatever. Mm -hmm. And um, so then I <clears throat> started writing, never really thinking about it being a book for a while. I would just write on subjects and put those on. and. Eventually, I decided it was going to be a book and kept writing. And actually, I was kind of embarrassed about the 30-year thing because that sounds like a long time you know, to be working on something. And it sounds like you're piddling or slow or whatever, but everybody thinks it's amazing. But part of that time was back then when I was just amassing the material, mm -hmm. researching. and. Uh, People would say, when are you going to be done? Or do you know? Or when do you expect to publish? And so forth. And I said, no, it, it'll be done when it's done. I'm not going to be pressured. And I right, just wanted right. to fully explore each section to the max, get all I could for it. Yeah, you mentioned, it for uh, year. <laughs> yeah so you mentioned starting a, a website. What, what year was that that you started a website? I think it was in 97. <clears throat> it was That's very like great early before. early internet yeah it was mm -hmm. actually somebody yeah. started for me they uh, somebody wanted to 
dip their feet into the internet and it was new. And so they said, can we put this document you've got? And it was kind of a list of all the sources I'd found out there. I call it a basic researcher's guide for if anybody else wanted to find the material, they could go there and find a book and go try to find a copy. Right. But then so it that, grew that Yes, yeah, so that, that was the start. So at that point, you had spent maybe seven years or so amassing documents and things. In in the, the 1990s, did, had you taken a trip to the UK to get some of these documents? No, I went in 2004 and 2014. Mm -hmm. And so at what, <clears throat> at what point did you decide, okay, I'm starting to amass these materials I'm starting. I'm trying to kind of put together a narrative. I've got I've got some documents and things. I need to go back to where this started. Well, I always knew that I needed to go and would be going at some point. It just worked out the timing then uh, with somebody over in Ireland who had found a bunch of material, and they he said, you know, you really need to come over here and come over here soon. This material is going to be moved, so. We decided to go that year, hmm. but it wouldn't make sense or even be credible to write a book about this without going over there, I didn't think. Mm -hmm. So at the time that you decided to start your website, you'd been out for about seven years. I'm, I'm going to guess you still had some family that were connected to or a part of the fellowship. Would that be correct? My mother and mother both left a year after I did. And I only have one sibling. And uh, my dad continued to his death in this fellowship. I did have some extended relatives, but most of them have all left. Mm -hmm. And then uh, within your your friend circle, um, how did you find, you know, how did they treat you, those who were still part of the fellowship, when you decided to leave? Well, I didn't go out quietly. I uh, wrote an exit letter and I sent it to a hundred friends and family telling them, and it was six pages telling them what I'd found. And I enclosed some copies of some documents. And uh, then I did a follow-up letter to a few of them, maybe a handful responded. And some people responded that I hadn't even sent the letter to it had been passed to them. And, uh, but I have been just slightly shunned, maybe. Uh, I just haven't been around the friends hardly ever. And my family still accepted me uh, at family reunions. You know, they kind of had to. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. It's not been a, a big deal. I haven't felt the hurt or pain hardly from mm -hmm. women. You said something really interesting that you sent 100 letters. So nowadays, maybe when we hear that, we're thinking email. But. I'm thinking you actually sent physical copies, like printed documents, mm -hmm. going to the post office, putting a stamp on it, mailing it out, which is quite a bit more work than just typing up an email and CCing. We didn't have people. email. <laughs> right. You had to. That was the only way. Yeah. And and so what, what really motivated you to go beyond just, I'll send this to maybe my field workers? Like, I'm going to send out 100 letters. And who did you decide who you're going to send it to? I don't think I sent it to any workers except one, and he had been a friend uh, of ours growing up and, you know, became a worker. But uh, mm -hmm. they, I had lived in, a, you know, in Mississippi and Oklahoma and Texas. I had a lot of friends in Texas. So, they, and I sent it to everyone in our local meeting in Oklahoma City, or mm -hmm. not everyone, but the ones I knew up there. I was only in meetings up there for two years or so before we left. Mm. And did anybody want to sit down with you, have a coffee with you, write a letter, make a phone call, anything like that after you'd sent that out? Mm -hmm. Nope. They just decided, well, this is too, maybe too hazardous to their own spiritual health or something or some sort of idea around that maybe. Or she knows where we are if she wants to come back. Fair enough. That that could be that too. Okay. so. Um, so you'd collect all this research. You took your first trip to the UK. 
in 2004. And part of that, if I understand correctly, was to begin examining uh, certain diaries that this individual, this, this gentleman had had. Uh, what, what were these diaries and did you discover anything that was surprising to you? Well, the man was a Catholic who uh, had been assigned a job in his parish to write a history book about the, the history of Catholicism in that parish. It was a group of people. And he found my website because they decided to make their, every parish in Ireland had to do this. And he, they decided to make, oh, excuse me. just had a phone call coming in. Sorry, I'll just... They decided to write about every church that had gotten started in their parish. Well, that's pretty much where uh, Irvine got started, in Rathmalayan. And uh, okay. so he had been around and he had found all this. He'd been to the homes. He'd gotten the pictures of the early workers, the gills and the carols, and just taken pictures of all the schoolhouse and so forth. And they had a, a lot of documents at the Church of Ireland there because they came out of the Church of Ireland, most of the young men and women, that like 40 of them left the church there, left it devastated. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, you've got to come see these. They're going to send them away. Well, they went away before I got there, but he managed to copy a lot of stuff off. There was another journal that we got a hold of that was really interesting. John Long's journal. There was an interesting story. Do we have time? We do. Okay. There was, uh, in the faith mission that William Irvine was a part of, they have a class for their new their people going through the, the course there. And they identify what is a cult. And they had a uh, page on William Irvine's church. And they gave all the, these different uh, traits about it and told them how it got started. And a young lady in the class said, that's my, um, about John Long. It mentioned John Long was with him. Said, that's my mm -hmm. grandfather. And so that was stored up in the mind of the manager or principal, I guess, of the, you know, that, the faith mission. And when one of the ex tubatus went over there to visit the faith mission, and he told him who he's with. He told him about this happening. So we, enough people got involved. We found the gal who found it, led us to John Long's son who had the diaries. And then one of the men over there took a copier to Mr. Long's house and copied them, uh, scanned them. He wouldn't let them out of his house. And uh, then he would email them to me and I typed them. And so then we got the diary, which we'd known existed, but we never had a copy of it. Even Doug Park didn't have a copy, and he mentioned it, but he didn't know about it. And it's all in handwriting, and it's volumes. And he he just wrote, you know, probably every other day or every mission that they were at for the first 17 years. I mean, he wrote more than that, but that's all we copied because he got kicked out in 1907. and. Then he did have his own ministry after that, and that's what he wrote about. He was no longer associated with Irvine's group. Mm -hmm. Wow, that, that's that's a lot of work just to, and, and maybe they had excellent penmanship, maybe not, but to parse through these diaries. And um, did any anything? There's one, other, clear? Thing. There's oh, one yeah. other really good story. Uh, a man was back in Ireland visiting and his relatives. And he, I don't know him, you know, just through a message board. And he says, is there anything I can do for you while I'm here in Belfast, twiddling my thumbs with the relatives? And I, I had heard of a, a lady who had been there. It's called the Public Records of Northern Ireland. And it, it's called Crony. She had been there to get her genealogy records and she'd ordered a box. And you order, put in an order and they'd bring it up, you know, two hours later. Well, the box that came up was not her genealogy at all. It was all about a lawsuit against Cooney and a bunch of the friends. And it was like three huge boxes. 
And she said, this is not for me. But she told her daughter about it, who told me about it. And so when my friend says, is there anything you can do? I said, yeah, go find this box of stuff at Crony. And he did. <laughs> and he, I said, you know, write down whatever it is, so forth, and let me know. And he could get copies. He said, Sheree, you have to come over here. There's no way. Uh, you, you just have to. So that's why we made the 2014 trip. And we okay. went through all those boxes. And it was um, eight lawsuits because the workers were accused of human trafficking, the sister workers. And um, oh. there was an angry, angry father whose four children, four of his six or seven children had gone in the work and just disappeared before his very eyes. And he was wealthy and he was furious. And so he... Uh, did a lot of things that were um, ruined people's reputation and some of the work uh, people's businesses. And they had to file suit in order to clear their reputations is what it was. And he had nothing to go on, but uh, you know, all these young girls just disappearing and from their parents and whatnot, it, it was kind of suspicious. And that was going on back then. Uh, right. traffic thing. So, uh, and it was all, all these different cases. And then one of them, two of them were Edward Cooney. Was, he filed against this farmer. And um, the, he took, um, he had all of the sister workers that came from Ireland that were all over the world write testimonial letters. So there was like a hundred letters, handwritten ones from them saying, I'm here of my own choice. Uh, you know, I'm not coerced. I can, can leave anytime I want. I can see my, just all kinds of stuff they all just kind of told a little story when they came in and left and i have copied a number of those and put them on telling the truth website people to read but yeah. that was a huge find and there's statements in there by william irvine for the court and for cooney irvine wasn't involved he was like gallivanting around the world like he did every year it all happened while he was gone around 1930. Okay. Wow. Uh, and this is quite a thing because normally, of course, when we hear human trafficking, we we think about uh, nowadays, usually it's modern day slavery and very often actually sexual trafficking. In your research uh, into the origins and sort of the growth of this fellowship, did you uncover any details of this kind of behavior, like in any court or any diaries or things like that, going back to the early days of the fellowship? I'm not sure your question. Did I uncover any? Uh, did you uncover any any documentation uh, of like, because you uncovered this, say, this court case where uh, a gentleman was trying to pursue charges of human trafficking, um, maybe against against the founders of the fellowship. But uh, did any of the documentation that you uncover in, indicate that there were incidences of abuse or sexual abuse or things like that that had taken place oh, no. in the early days? No. Mm -mm. So, yeah, so that, that didn't start coming up till later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you've kind of uncovered all, all of these things and you're, you're putting together this, this narrative. Um, what, what prompts you to keep going on a project like this when this is a fellowship that you're no longer a part of? Well, I'm an avid collector and, you know, I started collecting and I can't stop. <laughs> and people still send me stuff. I have received boxes and huge envelopes full of people getting rid of their notes and their pictures and so forth. And I dig through them for historical information that I can add to my body of information. And even though I can't include it in my book now, I uh, will be having a second edition which uh, is mainly just to correct a few things, add a few things here and there, but I probably will add another chapter onto it. But I can always add it to my website, Telling the Truth, and it, it goes hand in hand with my book. In the book, I source every quote, and they'll be able to find the context and the entire document over on Telling the Truth uh, website for themselves. Uh, I am just passionate about truth and justice. And I feel like 
Um, everyone associated with this church has a right to know about this history. They did not have all the facts to make a fully informed decision as to whether they wanted to be a part of it or not. And they had that right. And I'm making it right for them in my, uh, my viewpoint. What they do with this information is up to them. I'm not trying to persuade them to leave or to go to another church. I mean, my, I want everybody to let the Holy Spirit guide them into all truth, and he will, and keep them from being deceived. But with all the facts, they can reevaluate and make an informed decision that they're at peace with. Mm -hmm. So thinking from 1990 until, um, say when the the book itself was was published what what was the information that you may have gathered that you felt like you that, that was most important to you that you felt you would had you wished you'd had access to when you were younger if i hadn't believed it was the only way and that there was no alternative and of course we weren't stupid we didn't want to go to hell so we're going to stay mm -hmm. in it I would never have been in it. I mean, logically, it didn't match. Things didn't add up to me. So uh, that's the main hang-up that I had. Mm -hmm. I started out being very disgruntled with all the issues of the lady. Ladies had to be the example and all that. And uh, I was expected to be the example young lady on convention grounds, which I was not. I was rebellious, but I couldn't <laughs> act out on it very much with my parents. Mm -hmm. So it's just, I don't know. And I'm curious, when was the first time that you might have heard whispers of the this underlying scandal of child sexual abuse, sexual abuse, did you ever catch whispers of it during the time that you were professing? No, not a bit. The first I ever heard of it was after I connected with the author of uh, The Church Without a Name, Kathleen Lewis, and she had lived in uh, Washington State, and there were four elders there who had... Uh, allegations and some of them were imprisoned and she told me about it that was the very first time i ever heard of anyone and i was properly shocked and then mm -hmm. you know one by one especially when um the paul jenna star thing came to light with his daughter rebecca jenna star and i got involved with writing her story for her and we just learned, I just learned so much more was out there through the years, little by little. Mm. That, so what year was that when you learned from Kathleen Lewis about these elders? Early 90s. <laughs> and then in 2008, I was one of the seven who put together the Wings group. We, went, we launched Wings in 2008, my husband and mm. I and five others. Okay, that's that's actually quite fascinating. And so you, you decided that between the time that you first learned in the early 90s, so I guess we're talking about a 10 to 15 year span here, more and more has started to come out about all of this that had been taking place to this kind of this underbelly within the fellowship that there was a lot more than met the eye in terms of abuse and sexual abuse. And you felt that it was necessary to start to document this as well. As a group, we did, and there were several cases. <clears throat> it really started when Tim Severed was uh, caught, apprehended, arrested, imprisoned in uh, Minnesota. And that's when a number of us became concerned then because they weren't letting the, ch the families know about what he, was, he had done wrong. And... Uh, one of the members had young children there and she knew parents that had young children. And so she visited with Lyle Schober about it. And uh, so we just kind of put together wings after, after that. We wrote a letter for him and said, we want something like this sent out as notification to all the families in Minnesota. And uh, if you don't, we will. And mm -hmm. he did. So okay. 
he changed <laughs> like two or three words, maybe. I mean, it was nothing. And uh, yep. he sent it out. And that was like the first, to our knowledge, notification letter. Jerome Frandel followed suit. And then um, so did Ray Hoffman down in Texas, which those events came out about that same year. <laughs> close. So because w- when you started digging and researching and, and compiling all of this information and data, I don't suppose you had an inkling that, that this would be something that would start to be uncovered sort of in, in and around the time that you were you were doing all this work as well. And did that influence at all any of the work that you were doing as a historian? No, I kept that out of my book, stru- stuck strictly to the facts of how the sect developed and started. And I put a little bit in the last when I kind of bring it up to date, but Most of my material ends around 1965 or so. Uh, That was where I kind of brought the history to. The traditions I brought on up to a little further in years, covered that more. I figured that Wings was taking good care of that part of that subject, and we didn't need to overlap. Mm -hmm. And did you feel... Ever that uh, like what what made you decide that 1965 was kind of going to be the cutoff that it wasn't at that point there wasn't much need to document too much further from there. Well, it didn't change all that much from then on. The same overseers, you know, it come down to the same ones, and things were pretty much the same. <laughs> it what they weren't groping their way like they were in the beginning, and they weren't developing, and there weren't a lot of new things come along. Uh, there were just slight changes. Mm. And I, I think I remember growing up uh, just being told about, like, stay away from the Internet. You know, don't go digging. Don't go looking. If you look on the Internet, you know, uh, basically, like, something bad is going to happen to your faith. It's going to be undermined, you know. And I think you, you, you've you mentioned this before. Has it ever been your intention to undermine anyone's faith in God? No. I hope that what I write would encourage them to dig deeper, do a much Mm -hmm. deeper dive, as they call it, into scripture and to really develop their own personal relationship with God. I felt like I inherited my beliefs, and many of us do, that we're born and raised in it. Whatever, you know, our parents believed, we believed. We didn't question it for years. Then something comes along and makes you question. And eventually, some of us, and self-included, we make our beliefs our own. They mm-hmm. kind of sat on us before, but then we internalize them. And um, that's what I hope everyone will do, be firmly committed because it is internally a part of them and that something that they have evaluated and have jettisoned what they don't believe anymore, or don't find founded, and they have kept and hold dear the rest. I, I, I love that. And it's it's wonderful to hear that, you know, your goal has never been to destroy people's faith, but actually to encourage it. And, you know, I've had this inkling that like God can handle our questions. Mm-hmm. It seems to be that it's, it's historically been the ministry that has not wanted to handle questions as you've described. Uh, how, how do you, how do you feel about that? Well, it's like I said earlier, if they have scriptural answers for it, they'll answer. If they don't, then it's not scripturally supported. And so that's when they shut down the questions. Mm-hmm. And so uh, once Wings was started, and uh, this was before your book was ready to be published and whatnot, was there any further blowback from that and from sort of unveiling this? Or did you find that like the workers were supportive of your efforts to inform people because uh, and actually for those who might not know the acronym wings what does that stand for um i can't tell you right off um the i is it, for it, informed <laughs> I, it, worked, I don't, I think it, was, it was working to inform yeah working then, to inform in i don't know sexual abuse is a part of it but uh, yeah, so I'm not sure what the G is. And and so, but as you started to uh, be a part of a group that was documenting, uncovering this, did the group itself come under any kind of uh, duress or 
uh, what I say is blowback for actually documenting this? Or did you find that there were workers and overseers that were supportive of your efforts to expose these crimes that had been committed historically through the years? The group was all people who had left meetings. Mm -hmm. So we did not have all that much contact with workers. Our head man was Scott Ross, who is deceased now. And he was kind of the uh, liaison and he was be the one who approached the workers uh, with different things. Uh, my husband and I left after it got off the ground a year and a half, two years later, so I could get back to my boat and stuff. But uh, they didn't, they didn't, the workers didn't come around, didn't push back. I mean, we were a, somebody in the sky, kind of, you know, you're on the internet, you're an email, you're not a person they can <laughs> deal with. I've never had any worker contact me about anything ever <laughs> after I left. Right. Okay. And so what year was your book published finally? June, 2022, a year ago, okay. a over a year ago. Mm -hmm. That's that's quite remarkable, and it's it's a wonderful book. I have an electronic uh, a copy of it, and I have to admit, I actually found like the early life of William Irvine to be kind of fascinating. Like it's actually it's actually an interesting story, his journey, like just going back in history and seeing what life was like in those times. So I'm curious, how do you feel? Like, do do you think the the men that Irvine sort of inspired and and was a part of? Um, had had good godly intentions and do you feel like as you see what the ministry has evolved into now that it's actually like deviated away from what maybe Irvine and some of these other founders originally intended I think when they added the living witness doctrine that was the beginning of their downfall that corrupted a lot of things changed a lot of things inside um <laughs> There were there's a lot of sincere people in it, and I'd like to say that I've never considered the people in meetings anything other than my brothers and sisters in Christ, even though I'm not among them. Uh, people think if those of us that leave that we hate people inside or that we think they're unsaved. It's some people that may be true, but many of us do not reject them as Christians. Mm -hmm. Right, because at the heart of it, members of this fellowship are still intent on following the Bible and serving God as best they know and understand. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm comfortable saying that, you know, God knows those who sincerely want to serve him wherever they happen to be. Mm -hmm. And that's far more important than following a particular form. And we know that there have been many who have followed a form to the letter and given the appearance of being extremely devout. Jesus actually spoke against those who fought so hard to appear to be incredibly devout. And it seems like, as we have learned, especially in recent times, that there have been many who have used that actually as a cover for devious and, and deviant sort of behavior. One, one last question before we wrap up. I, I was kind of curious, and I don't know that you would have too much information about this, but in your, in your again, investigation and research, did you uncover much about the finances of the group or any, anything of that nature? No, I did not. My mother told me that the workers had plenty of money, that she'd been out to the brother workers' quarters and saw a bunch of money out on the table that said, help yourself. <laughs> but, uh, this was some, there's, you know, brother workers joke or something kind of deal. But right, right. I was just always of the opinion that they had plenty, but I did hear a, a really cool story of, one sister worker telling about the depression, how they had flour and some milk. And she said, if only I had an egg, I could make a pancake. And she said a chicken was there the next day and laid them an egg every day for as long as they were there. And she looked out on that and the Lord brought that chicken. And he may have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like the Elijah and the widow. and the. Uh... They don't all, haven't always had plenty of money is what I'm saying, you know. Right. Right. Fair fair enough. Um, so if people have listened to this conversation today, and I would strongly encourage them to read your book. I think it's just a really phenomenal historical work. I think it's really fascinating to learn 
about the history of this fellowship. So preserving the truth, for those who are watching the video, you can see a copy of the cover of the book there on the screen, a picture of William Irvine, pretty handsome fella, actually. You know, <laughs> and, and he was quite a successful fella as well before he, he really kind of dove into this, this type of ministry, this homeless itinerant ministry. Uh, just a remarkable work. work of, if people would like to purchase a copy of the book, where can they find it? If they go to Amazon and put in the word truth and my last name, Crop, It'll pull up the book. Okay. In, in order. Yeah, well. I do not sell it direct. It's it's in Barnes and Noble and many other stores, uh, mm -hmm. but Amazon's the biggest seller. For sure. And for those who are listening to the audio version of this, the last name is spelled K R O P P. So truth and crop, and they'll find a copy of the book. So as we close out this episode, I always like to ask my guests if there was some words of wisdom or words of encouragement. You know, you've spent many, many years uh, as, a, as a devout Christian, uh, whether inside or outside of this fellowship. What, what words would you like to share to anyone who listened to this episode today? Well, I cannot encourage you enough to allow the Holy Spirit to be your guide. He will guide you into all truth. The Lord has promised that. And he will keep you from being deceived. It's one of my favorite quotes, though, is condemnation without investigation is ignorance. And mm. that does a world of things. People who close their eyes and minds and refuse to read the book and condemn it. And I've heard them say, why would I want to read a book by that bitter lady who left? And then other people say, no, it's not bitter. It's just facts. But, you know, immediately they haven't read it. If if they're condemning it, because I tried my dead level best not to have anything that would offend meetings or the people. And I had three professing people read it for me, proofread it and tell me anything they thought would be offensive. And I adjusted it. <laughs> so I uh, really encourage everyone to use that in their life. Don't condemn something without investigating. Be researchers. I'm a lover of truth and I'm passionate about truth and justice. And that's why I am where I am. I'm trying to do for others what I wish had been done to me. I wish I'm telling the truth. Mm. Thank you so much. I, I absolutely love that. And I can say with utter sincerity, having the pleasure of speaking with you today, that you're the furthest thing from bitter. You're, you're a delight to talk to. There's many, many stories that would be fun to explore. And I think this is why it'd be uh, uh, a real delight for others to, to read and to enjoy the book that you've compiled. And I, I definitely look forward to the next edition of it coming out. Sheree, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you for being on and thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you for asking me. Thank you so much for tuning in to The Hidden Truth. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and leave a review because that helps this podcast to reach and inspire more people. It is so important that these stories are heard so that we continue to raise awareness and support victim survivors in their healing journey. For those who have been affected but haven't found your voice yet, I hope these stories inspire you to keep moving forward on your healing journey. Take care.